welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Amanda McGill Johnson, the Executive Director of Nebraska Cures. Our nonprofit organization has, has the mission to promote, advocate, and support um, health science research for the betterment of our health and our economy. And we are really thrilled today to be hosting this really important panel discussion about an, an issue that um, you know, sometimes gets overlooked in the larger discussion about climate change, and that is how that change and extreme weather events are impacting our personal health and the health of our communities. So we put together a really stellar panel uh, of experts here in Nebraska on this topic. The way that this presentation will run is that um, each of them will give a little presentation um, in their expertise and we'll leave a little gap in time to take questions from people who are, are participating live today. And then at the end, we will have a little extra time to take additional questions for the whole panel. Um, to get started, I'm gonna do some very brief introductions um, before we launch into things. Um, first, uh, Dr. Martha Sholsky. She's the Nebraska State Climatologist and Director of the Nebraska State Climate Office and is also a professor at UNL. We have Dr. Jesse Bell. He's the director of the Water Climate and Health Program at UNMC in their College of Public Health. We have Dr. Jill Poole, the chief of the Division of Allergy and Immunology at UNMC. And Dr. Allison Freifeld, professor of internal medicine and an infectious disease specialist at UNMC. So thank you all for taking the time to join us today and, and share your wealth of knowledge with us. So we'll get started with you, Martha. Great, thanks, Amanda. I'm gonna share my screen here. And it feels odd being called doctor when there are medical doctors here on the panel that I'm serving with. <laughs> All right, so as Amanda mentioned, um, I serve as state climatologist for Nebraska. So that means that I get to communicate to a whole range of audiences about climate variability and climate change. So I'm gonna give you kind of the elevator speech version of climate change here in our state. Um, just as a very brief um, intro, so I'm with the Nebraska State Climate Office. Most states in the country do have a state climate office and part of our operations involve um, understanding and observing our environment. And so one of our weather stations, um, which is part of the Nebraska Mesonet, we're observing the high winds that are going on right now. Uh, that's, that's a big part of our office is tracking current and emerging um, issues that we have. So um, I teach a 100 level class on climate change and I start the class and I start a lot of climate presentations with this slide. Um, climate change can be a really difficult, um, big complex thing to try and wrap your head around and understand. So I, I like to um, articulate five, what I think are key messages um, to, to take away from this, this next 10 minutes that I have uh, with you is the fact that climate change is real and it's here now. It's not something that we're waiting to happen. It's not something in a far off place. It is real and it's here now and it is already impacting us here in Nebraska the impacts to climate change are felt disproportionately. Um, underserved populations, marginalized populations are typically feel climate change um, in a way that other populations don't. Um, and sometimes those that are responsible, more responsible for the cause of climate change are, are don't really have to deal with the impacts uh, of, of, of climate change. So this disproportionality is a definite theme um, with regard to climate change impacts. And I think you're gonna hear more about that uh, from the other speakers. Um, the fact that we are the cause of the climate change, um, but we are also the solution. So that's an important aspect to remember. Um, the fact that we must act now is a really important factor. We must act now to mitigate future climate change and reduce um, the, the most severe implications. And then finally, um, a key message that I'm gonna to touch on um, in the latter part of the, the slides here is connecting with common values. And sometimes it's very difficult to talk about climate change in a meaningful way, but a big part of the solution um, is trying to connect with, find something to connect on to talk through solutions to climate change. So um, in a nutshell, this is Nebraska's climate past. So let's kind of think of where we have been and then we'll think about where, where we're going and where we're headed. Um, Nebraska is warming up, um, especially at night and in recent decades. 
nighttime lows are marching up twice as fast as daytime high temperatures are. That has implications for human and animal comfort. If we don't cool down a lot at night, then, then there's implications for human health. Um, the rate of change is speeding up. Uh, in recent decades, we are warming more quickly than what we have in the past. We know that precipitation is increasing overall. Um, we do still have dry periods and we do have droughts. We're in a current drought situation right now. Um, so it's not to say that we don't have droughts, but overall precipitation has uh, increased for Nebraska, for much of the state. Humidity is also higher. So that's a way in which um, we're feeling an increase in moisture um, is through humidity values, um, which certainly has an influence as well on human comfort um, if it happens in conjunction with these high temperatures. And then finally, the weather is getting more variable with more extreme events. And what I have here on the screen is for those of you that are in Omaha uh, now, you may remember this event from last August, it was a flash flood event. Um, so more heavy rainfall events, more, um, more flash flooding, more erosion, um, and all the implications that come with that. So in a nutshell, that is our climate past. Um, so let's think in terms of climate change, how are we feeling the impacts? And it is often through weather kinds of events that we feel the impacts of climate change. You know, climate is the clothes in my closet and weather is the clothes that I'm wearing today. So weather's kind of the, what's happening here and now, but that's strongly connected um, to, to our overall climate. So it's important to, to keep in mind that extreme events locally as well as far away from us do have an impact. So something like the flood of 2019, which had significant impacts, it affected much of Nebraska and, and other portions of the Central Plains. Um, this is a way in which, which we're feeling climate change. Um, climate change plays, since it's real and it's here now, it plays a role in these extreme events that, um, that we're impacted by. So things like loss of life, um, just recovery from a significant event like this and the toll that it has on mental health. These are all ways in which we are feeling um, this increase in extreme events. Or if you have asthma and you're impacted by wildfire smoke, um, the fires in the West, um, we have amplified risk of wildfire because of warming temperatures, because of dry conditions. Um, there is greater risk for wildfire activity. So if we're impacted by smoke, we are feeling climate change. And then finally, something that you maybe not don't um, connect with that doesn't happen in Nebraska, but hurricane activity uh, is also linked to climate change with more intense hurricanes, um, then there's implications to that. Things like humanitarian aid or even um, populations uh, move, having to move because their, their homes were destroyed or the area isn't livable anymore. Again, these are all impacts that we're feeling to climate change. So um, our climate future, that's really up to us to decide. Um, this is a little bit of a complicated graphic here, but in the, the dark gray curve, that's the global average temperature um, history over the last century. So we can choose the, the aqua curve. That's our temperature going forward when we act on climate change. And then the, the orange curve, that's with no mitigative action. Um, so we do not want that orange um, curve that you see. That's a rate of warming that is just not sustainable. So the need um, has never been greater to put climate action into place uh, now. So what, what does a global average temperature change actually mean for, for us? And the example I'm going to show is for Lincoln. Um, just a few decades out in the, into the future, um, our average temperature will be similar to present day Wichita, Kansas. So we'll warm by about five degrees on average. So that, again, that puts present day um, 
southern Nebraska into, into southern Kansas. Um, so you can see that the coloration that you see on the globe, that indicates an amount of warming. You'll see it's higher for the Arctic, um, and these high latitude areas are going to warm at a much faster rate than, than us here in the mid-latitudes. when and how we get our precipitation will change. Um, so warm temperatures will warm and how we get our rainfall throughout the course of the year um, will, will change. More precipitation is predicted to occur during the colder time of year. So from about November through March or April, we're expected to have more precipitation than what we do now. Um, unfortunately, the climate projections are calling for less precipitation during the summer. So thinking back to the March 2019 flood event, um, heavy rain events, more precipitation when the ground is potentially frozen, um, certainly um, speaks to, to implications like springtime snowmelt flooding. Um, and a, another factor here is when we do get precipitation, it will generally come in heavier rainfall events as opposed to the nice gentle rainfall events. So this um, shift in when, you know, what time of year, and how we get our precipitation um, will change because of climate change. Um, something that's important to consider is we will still get cold, um, so we'll still have to think in terms of a risk for, for these significant cold events. So if you remember February of last year, we were uh, much colder than normal. We set all kinds of records. I believe it was the fifth coldest February on record for Nebraska. So there can still be climate change, and we can still have a cold extreme event. It, it doesn't mean that this a cold event will never happen. So we have to prepare for this and keep this in mind, even in the face of climate change. Um, so thinking of and preparing for um, changes going forward, think about these changes exceeding what we have experienced in the past century. So for to me, that really speaks to a transformational change in how we think of adaptation. If it's something that we haven't gone through and haven't experienced before, then we need to, then we need to pivot or, or think of adaptation in, the, in a whole new light. Okay, so the last um, items that I wanted to touch on was this idea of, of communication and thinking about how we talk about climate change and, and and looking at climate and our health, I think is really important because that's something that you can connect with people on um, because science is not enough. Um, if science were enough, we would have solved this a long time ago. So appealing to something that is both the heart and the minds of people, um, can we can really start to move the needle forward um, in my opinion. So, um, do we talk about climate change um, in general in this country? Um, we don't. We're 33% we're of Nebraskans as of a couple of years ago said that they discuss global warming at least occasionally. And it can be very tough to talk about. Um, but to me, that's really one of the big um, parts of the solutions to climate change is, is talking about it in a meaningful way. And again, I think tying that to our health is a great way, um, can be a great avenue um, to, to discuss this topic. So um, I just thought I'd put a Nebraska perspective on the, the national map that you saw earlier. So um, I, I give, you know, tens of presentations um, or dozens of presentations a year to several thousand people and, and I've done so for the last six years and kind of getting a sense of how people feel in this state when it comes to climate change is there's three general categories where you've got what I consider um, a harmful group, which is still kind of argumentative um, about climate change or the science or putting solutions into place. Um, and then you've got um, these, what I call active participants, and they may be in advocacy groups. Um, they're, they're actively working toward climate 
action, climate mitigation and adaptation. And there's a big part of the state that does fall into this category. Um, and then um, what I, where I feel the most people are in is maybe they were in that, say that harmful category, but they've, they felt the impacts of climate change and they're moving over into this other category, which they're curious about it. They want to learn more and they're willing to talk through um, solutions. So I'm just giving you kind of a sense of how, how my interactions with people across the state, how they feel um, about climate change. So um, I've, I've been asked, what is this? Um, there's often climate reports that will, will be published and the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their sixth assessment report came out um, about six months ago. And this, when it did, uh, and I was asked, what do you think of this? And what does this mean? And to me, it comes down to, we need to act uh, now. Um, so this quote came to mind, which I use in my class. And it says, what's the use of having developed the science well enough to make predictions if in the end, all we're willing to do is stand around and wait for them to come true. So it's um, very relevant um, to the climate change issue. So I will, um, I will stop there and there's my contact uh, information. I'll give you a moment to write that down and I will stop sharing my screen. And if anyone has any questions for Dr. Shulsky, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. I know I really appreciate some of those last slides about where Nebraskans really are at and how many people are curious and just the importance of, of messaging and communicating and even just talking about it more. Um, uh, I think maybe at the end of the, once everybody's presented, maybe we can get everybody's additional thoughts on, on that communication piece and how we could be doing that to lift up our communities and shed more light. Um, don't see any questions currently in the Q&A box. So let's go ahead and pivot to uh, Dr. Bell. Thank you. Let's see, let me pull this up. Hopefully you're seeing that correctly. All right, yes. excellent. Um, so I, I always like following Martha because she gives such a good overview of, of climate and understanding. I also don't like following her at times as well because she's such a great uh, public speaker. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about climate disasters and how they're impacting Nebraska. As Martha already mentioned, uh, we are in a changed climate and that changed climate is having impacts on us. And here in Nebraska, we're definitely quite aware about how climate is impacting our communities and our history and our society and even our health. Um, the history of Nebraska is defined by a climatic event. The Dust Bowl of the 1930s, when it took place, there was a major drought event that occurred. Uh, there's even some photos here that come from uh, Nebraska looking at how the Dust Bowl was impacting uh, the state. And one of the things that, you know, this has also been tied to the, the Great Depression and, and we saw the impacts on communities and potentially loss of populations in the area. And so this is just showing that already in Nebraska, we understand that climate has an impact on us and has an impact on our society. But moving forward, as Martha said, we are in a changed climate. Uh, over the last 50 to 100 years, we, are, we have experienced changes in our climate system, and those changes in our climate system are having impacts on us. In 2016, I was a part of a, a report that came out that was an assessment of, of climate and how climate and climate change was impacting human health. It brought together experts throughout the federal government, uh, academia, the private industry. We had experts from uh, the Defense Department, um, the Department of Energy, uh, HHS, CDC, you name it, NOAA, NASA. We had medical doctors, we had physicists, and everybody in between. And with this report and all the, the information that was gathered as, as we started to evaluate what was going on in, in terms of climate and how it was impacting human health and how climate change was impacting human health, there were a number of findings that came out from the report, but at the very beginning of the report, these two sentences uh, really stood out to me. And this was consensus based off of all the expertise that was involved. Climate change is a significant threat to the health of the American people, and that every American is vulnerable to the health impacts associated with climate change. And the reason we say that is 
everywhere in the United States, we're experiencing climate change. And we will continue to experience climate change into the future as well. And that has impacts on us now, and it will have impacts on us in the future. So I put this figure up here because I want you to understand how we get from changes in our climate system down to human health outcomes. And so up at the very top, you see our climate drivers. So this is our increases in temperature, changes in precipitation, like what Martha was talking about, more extreme weather events, and rises in sea level, which we really don't have to worry about here in Nebraska so much. And those things then impact our environment in some capacity and impact, uh, they basically act as an exposure pathway so that to our human health outcomes. So that change in the environment then leads to the human health outcomes that you see it below. And there's just a few here that were that are mentioned, but there's a number of others as well. And so this is a complex pathway, but this pathway exists. And it's been shown time and time again that there is a relationship with climate, changes in climate, and how it's related back to our health. Now, the reason I put this figure up because I think it's really important are these gray boxes, the environmental institutional context and the social and behavioral context. That's the environment that we live in. That is the individuals that live in the communities that we live in. Those are the things that are one, influenced by changes in our climate, but those are also the things that influence this pathway. And so these are, as medical doctors would refer to it as social determinants of health. These are, um, you know, the social and behavioral context is the age of the population, gender, race, ethnicity, poverty, um, housing, infrastructure, age of infrastructure, education, discrimination, access to care, pre-existing health conditions. And so, and then on the op opposite side, we have the environmental institutional context. Like I said, that is our community. That's the infrastructure in our community. That is also the, um, uh, the environment that we live in. So land use change, ecosystem change, infrastructure, geography, uh, agricultural use and practices in the surrounding area. And those are the things that when we see changes in our climate or we see climate driven disasters, which I'm gonna talk about, those are the things that can either increase the societal and human health impacts or potentially decrease the societal or human health impacts. These are also the things that we can influence in some way by improving our infrastructure, addressing some of these uh, social determinants of health and reducing human health outcomes associated with a changing climate and also climate driven disasters. And so I put this up here, and one of the things I really wanna make sure I drive home and, and make it very clear is climate change can act as a threat multiplier, as the military would potentially say. Um, climate change can help trigger some of these events and human health outcomes, but it's us and how we respond and prepare that influences the outcomes. And so whether we prepare and respond to potential climate-driven disasters now or in the future, or we don't, influences whether or not we see an increase in human health outcomes in the future or not. So I said that all populations are vulnerable, um, but certain populations are more at risk than others, especially here in the United States, and that's very true here in Nebraska as well. And the populations that are most at risk, typically here in the United States, are communities of color, older adults, low-income communities, and children. And the reason for that, it goes right back to those gray boxes in that previous slide that I just showed. It is um, pre-existing health conditions. It is access to care issues. It is where some of these populations occur, like low-income communities can be in floodplains. And then also uh, discrimination and uh, issues like that that can exist within the community as well. And so there's a variety of different reasons for that. I would also add rural populations to this as well. And we'll talk about that just in a second. And so this is from some work that I did a few years ago where we we're looking at all the different ways that individuals are, are potentially killed um, or deaths that are attributed to different climate driven disasters here in the United States. And so we were looking at some statistics based over uh, 2004 to 2013. And one of the first things that you'll notice is that likely heat waves 
kill more people in the United States than any other climate related disaster. And that surprises some people because you think of you know, massive hurricanes and tornadoes and flooding events and, and how that could potentially be more related to human health outcomes than heat waves. But when you think of the way that heat waves manifest compared to some of these other disasters, you start to understand why that occurs. Because even here in Nebraska, you'll see multiple heat waves in a given year. Um, there's heat waves here in Omaha, there's heat waves in Grand Island, there's heat waves out in Scotts Bluff. And each time one of those heat waves occur, there is a potential for a human health outcome uh, associated with that. And honestly, heat is one of the easiest of, of attributing um, a death or a hospitalization to compared to some of these other disasters, which makes it a little bit more complex because this is only capturing the direct health impacts. We also have the indirect health impacts. These are the things that are delayed or manifest over time. And I'll talk about a, 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 an example of that in just a second. But each time we have one of these events, not only is there a human health impact, but there's also an impact on society as well. And just to kind of illustrate that to some extent, over here in this gray box over on the right, we have billion dollar losses from disasters over this same time period. Hurricanes led to $40 billion in the United States. Heat waves and droughts, 80 billion. Tornadoes and severe storms, almost 50 billion and flooding and severe storms was up around 30 billion. So, and honestly, these numbers don't even calculate in human health costs. So this doesn't ca calculate in hospitalizations, insurance costs, all these other factors associated with human health. This is only looking at financial losses and economic losses within communities. So if you can imagine that if we added those in, it'd be much greater. And so, one of the points that I wanted to make here is billion dollar disasters are increasing. These are climate and weather related disasters. NOAA, where I used to work, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they would calculate the number of climate related disasters that occurred each year and, and estimate the financial impacts, the economic impacts that that was having. And they've been doing that since 1980. And one of the things that you'll notice is those climate related disasters one, we're seeing more and more of them that are associated with billion dollar losses. So each one of those disasters exceeds a billion dollars of economic loss in some capacity. And so we've been seeing more of those over the last 40 plus years. Also, you'll notice in 2020, we think of 2020 in the context of the pandemic, right? 2020, the pandemic hit, it caused wide-scale disruption of uh, the United States, but also around the globe. But also when we think of 2020, we should be thinking of it as a record-breaking year for climate-related disasters, billion-dollar disasters. Because in that year, we had 22, for the first time in the United States, we had 22 climate-related billion-dollar disasters. And then last year, in 2021, we had uh, 20 climate related billion dollar disaster. So we've been seeing more of these and Nebraska is definitely susceptible. Here's one example, Martha talked about it briefly, of one of those billion dollar disasters that hit here in Nebraska. We've had many others, but this one was probably one of the most impactful and, and memorable. This is in 2019, we saw flooding. Nebraska was at the epicenter of that flooding event that started in March of that year. Um, it led to about $10.8 billion of economic loss. It was the costliest inland flooding event in US history. It displaced hundreds of people. There were three reported deaths, but as I just talked about briefly before, uh, reported deaths and direct deaths do not capture the full breadth of how many people are impacted and the number of potential human health impacts associated with this potential or with this particular uh, disaster or any disaster. There are also at least two hospitals in Nebraska that sustained some damage from this flooding event. And there are at least a dozen long-term care facilities that were evacuated because of this flooding event just here in Nebraska alone. So that was the initial impacts, but then we also had access to care issues. 
that happen, in, especially in rural populations around the state. Flooded roads, damaged infrastructure, damaged roads. That led to people, you know, and I'm from Nebraska and I was trying to drive home. It took uh, what used to be a three hour drive all of a sudden turned into a six hour drive. And for me, that was an inconvenience, but if you're trying to go to a dialysis center or to a hospital or to seek care, that becomes a very big and important barrier in, in seeking care and seeking treatment. And so just to kind of highlight some of the complexity of this, I wanna talk a little bit about mental health. And so, you know, those are the, there's those direct impacts. Those are the things that send you to the hospital immediately when you have a climate driven disaster. But there's also the delayed impacts. And Martha talked about it a little bit with the flooding because there was an increase in reported um, uh, calls to suicide prevention hotlines during that time. But we also know, especially in rural communities, farmers in particular um, have high suicide rates. Farming, uh, farmers actually, as far as all occupations, has one of the highest suicide rates compared to many other occupations. There's this news report that I put in here from a Kansas farmer that said, nothing gets a farmer down more than a drought. And that was in context of asking this particular farmer about the impacts that, um, uh, why there were potentially such high suicide rates. And he voluntarily talked about the impacts that drought has on him. We've also seen this in other communities as well. Australia has seen these kind of sharp upticks. And so we published a study last year um, that was looking at this. And this was over this region of the United States. And so this was throughout the Midwestern part of the United States. There was a survey that was going out to farmers. And it happened to fall right when the 2012, 2012 drought happened. And so within the survey, it was more about occupational injury, but within the survey itself, there was a question about stress, like individual reported stress. And one of the things that we found when we evaluated that was the, when we looked at that drought event and looking at that survey of all these different farmers, the effect estimate for drought was four times greater magnitude than people reporting pain in other parts of their body. And so basically what that's saying is that drought event, when it occurred, caused more stress, farmers were more likely to report stress than if they were experiencing injuries to other parts of their body, you know, broken bones, sore back, et cetera. So Nebraska can address the health impacts associated with climate change. There's examples of this already going on. Um, we are in a change climate, so there we need to start addressing how that change climate is impacting us and our health. Um, for example, each of these states that are in blue are states that are receiving funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to enact um, public health preparedness activities around climate and climate change. And so as you can see, there's not a lot of them, and there's definitely a big hole in the middle, and Nebraska is not one of these states. Now, this doesn't cover all the states that are addressing this issue. There are a number of states that have internal funding that they are dedicating to addressing climate change. Um, but these are the states that are receiving funding, uh, federal support to do this work. And so that is one activity that we can be doing here in the state to better understand and better prepare for climate change and better prepare for the climate events that we're already facing as well. And by educating or by uh, engaging with public health, we can engage uh, the public, educate the public. We can better enhance monitoring around some of these impacts that climate change is having on our health. We can do better research. We can contribute to public dialogue. There's a lot of opportunities to engage public health and make sure that we're doing preparedness activities now and also for the future and by and paying attention to what the future systems might look like as our climate continues to change. And one of the points I always like to put up here when I talk about this is that public health spending is estimated to be about 1.5 to 3% of all US health spending. So when we look at how much we spend on US on health in the United States, public health is only somewhere between 1.5 to 3%. So we don't spend very much on prevention and as I mentioned, climate change is something that is coming at us and is already here as well. So we're even spending a smaller percentage on that. So just in closing, 
Climate change is a significant threat to our health. All populations are vulnerable. Some are more at risk than others. The costs associated with, with these events are, or with these climate related disasters are increasing. And Nebraska can take action to reduce health impacts associated with climate change. And then lastly, and most importantly, a lack of preparedness, planning, and understanding can only increase the severity of a disaster, especially a climate-driven disaster. And so with that, I just wanna say thank you very much. And I look forward to any questions or comments that you have. What great information. Like that slide on the billion dollar events just is uh, stunning and, and upsetting. Um, when you look at, you then connected the dots to all the health impacts that that can have. And that's pretty frightening. Um, if anyone has questions, pop them in the, the q and I'll just rise up, raise up a couple of the comments. Just someone commented that people with disabilities of all ages are another one of those groups that can be highly impacted. And then someone else expressed just a concern about tropical diseases, ticks, parasites, and how changes in climate may bring more of that closer to Nebraska or into Nebraska. All right, and with that, I don't see any additional um, questions. So Dr. Poole. Thank you, Amanda. Um, it's great going after Jesse and Martha here. Um, do you see the full screen or how's this look for everyone? It looks all right. All right. Well, I'm Dr. Jill Poole. So I am an allergy uh, immunologist here at UNMC. And this is our campus. And I'm uh, currently sitting uh, over here today in the DRC building. Oh, Dr. Poole, just so you know, we do see the next slide frame. Oh, you do? Okay. Let's see here. How can I do there? There. Is that better? There we go. Perfect. There we go. All right. So uh, climate uh, changes. Uh, certainly affect allergic disorders. Um, and I'm gonna kind of go into different uh, rationale of why, but there's definitely been changing patterns of outdoor aeroallergens. So the outdoor environment uh, allergens, and this is due to increasing temperatures, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are really the major factors that have been linked to this increased duration of pollen seasons, pollen production, and possibly even contributing to how allergenic the pollens are. And so the diseases that you know, I see um, affected is that we've certainly seen an increase in the frequency, the severity, and the duration of the nasal sinus eye symptoms, as well as lower uh, airway diseases such as asthma and even can affect COPD too. And so ragweed pollen uh, being in Nebraska People should be aware of ragweed. And I like this, uh, this is a picture of what ragweed looks like in case uh, you're not sure. Uh, what we've seen is this increase in the duration of ragweed season. Ragweed is usually in the fall. Um, and if there's a delay in uh, frost or uh, how the weather patterns are, we're having longer duration. So here in, in Omaha and Nebraska, over time, we've seen the ragweed pollen season is actually 10 days longer. So, and as you even go further north, uh, the Canadians are having even longer uh, ragweed pollen seasons that they have. And so this is showing this the trend that we're seeing uh, more problems. Uh, the other that's common right now of people on this uh, webinar are spring allergy sufferers is the juniper. And this is a study that actually came out of Oklahoma. But what it's is showing, looking from 1986 to 2016, there's obviously a lot of scatter in the dots. So some years are worse than others. But over uh, these uh, decades, we're overall seeing an increase in the seasonal pollen in the spring of the red cedar and the amount of the grains there are. So the long-term trends are that the pollen is higher and longer, uh, but there is definitely a year-to-year -year seasonal variation. Now, carbon dioxide is actually very interesting in that there are winners and losers in plants and trees with uh, CO2. So ragweed loves carbon dioxide, so it grows faster, it flowers early, and it produces more pollen. Uh, grass pollen production also increases in carbon dioxide environments. And it's really more of the urban versus the rural areas that are gonna see more of the carbon dioxide. And I like this showing from farming up into, you know, this is looking in Baltimore about how uh, carbon dioxide and how that affects the flowering of weeds. 
The other thing, um, molds, a lot of people are mold sufferers and the mold alternary, which is highly prevalent around uh, Nebraska and, uh, and Omaha also goes really quite well in CO2 environments. So a lot of these allergenic uh, pollens grow well. As already alluded to in both Jesse and Martha's talks is that as sea levels rise or ocean warms, we're seeing more devastating storms. And from an allergy perspective, uh, this is a picture that was uh, given to me from down uh, south from the Hurricane Katrina. Uh, it does just terrible destruction to homes that you get this heavy microbial and mold growth and that there's reconstruction efforts uh, that have to be underway to clean this out. And we're seeing that the people that go in to, to help remediate the problem are suffering from allergy and asthma symptoms of having more breathing difficulties. Uh, about a third of them during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and then more recently for the Hurricane uh, Maria in Puerto Rico, there was a rise in asthma and asthma severity. And that's because uh, of this gasoline powered generators, they saw high mold. And then there was an increase in rodents and cockroaches in the environment. And so there has to be attention to when we have these disasters of taking care of the workers who are gonna go back into the uh, areas and clean it up. Uh, we've talked a lot about masks these last two years. Uh, we really recommend the elastomeric uh, uh, metric respirator versus the N95. The workers who wore this uh, device had much better respiratory protection than the N95. And so stockpiling these or, or being prepared uh, for the devastating after effects of these uh, storms. Uh, the other impact of climate change, um, it interacts with air pollution to affect asthma. So air pollution from fossil uh, fuel burning and traffic related emissions will actually interact with allergens and this worsens asthma. Uh, this is a friend of mine down at UNC. Uh, she's recently published a review looking at the gases that we see from the farming community, a lot of that ammonia that is uh, produced from animals gets into the air with wind and weather changes and fertilizer and farm byproducts, it can make uh, these complex compounds that get carried to the city and we're having more particulate exposure in urban areas. So we are all one connected um, environment. Uh, I wanted to put about crop burning just to let you know that this is a relatively common practice across the United States, not just the world. Um, we see this, uh, that it quickly removes the residual plant material and waste after a harvest. And I think a lot of people are familiar with the Kansas uh, farming practices where they do burn that. And in the springtime, uh, we, have, uh, we have alerts by our news media about the smoke and that's coming from these crop burning practices. What's been interesting is this crop burning in the spring can interact with the allergen pollens or if it's crop burning in the fall, interact with the fall pollens. And we're seeing uh, worsening uh, respiratory diseases. Uh, Dr. Jesse Bell has been working and I've been working with a student of his uh, showing an increase in pediatric asthma ER visits uh, here in Omaha uh, related to the uh, seasons that crop burning is, is done and how it interplays with um, allergic disorders. Uh, which has already been talked to by uh, Martha about the wildfire smoke. Um, we see these air pollution spikes. I like this slide because it shows that we're having more wildfires uh, and uh, the frequency are, are more severe. And these spikes, this is a, you can't, you know, if you're driving, it's very, very dense. And already alluded to is that there's vulnerable subjects and asthmatics um, are a vulnerable subject as well as those with COPD showing that it was really the asthmatics who had worsening um, lung function, but so did normal people had worsening lung function uh, symptoms, but it was really pronounced in our vulnerable uh, subjects, those that have underlying disease. So trying to get through that kind of quickly for you, um, but climate impacts, directly impacts allergy and asthma diseases really on an annual basis, we see the changes. Um, but over time, we've seen an increase in pollen seasons, pollen counts, and perhaps how allergenic they are. Um, we have to adapt to these uh, challenges, really uh, involved in occupational uh, medicine, that we need to protect our workers. 
and that we have to be prepared to tackle anticipated problems such as these, these storms and smoke events. And we need to continue to follow these trends in pollen and that the allergy community itself can help promote protection to our patients. So I want my last slide here is looking at what I call our efforts. Um, my partner here at UNMC Nebraska Med Center is Dr. Andrew Rory. We got a pollen counter as part of our division and we have it on top of our Durham Research Center 2 building. And we've been educating uh, students and residents and fellows, uh, doing outreach on the pollen. We form partnerships with the College of Public Health with Dr. Bell and his colleagues. Uh, we're giving education at local, regional, and national levels, giving talks, engaging the medical students. And we're trying to get uh, the word out. And we have pollen counts uh, that you can follow us on social media, Twitter and Facebook. I'll put a plug in for UNMC allergies. So we post about twice a week during when there's no ice or snow on our pollen machine. <laughs> so with that, um, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Poole. Um, I don't see any questions currently. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna go ahead um, and, and see if Dr. Freifield is ready to go here. I, I know like the information you gave is very helpful. Are there, I guess one question I have real quick, or are there things that individuals can be doing themselves to try to protect themselves from some of these increases in pollen and et cetera? <laughs> well, um, closing your windows, running the AC, showering and changing clothes after being outside. Um, is what you yourself, if you're um, allergenic and paying attention to it because the tree pollen always starts way earlier than people um, anticipate and getting on top of medicines, but that's a uh, very specific for allergy. Uh, okay, Dr. Freifeld, are you, well, there she is, she's sharing her screen there now. We'll go ahead and, and send it to her. Oh, we cannot hear you. There you go. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, and is that showing up as? Yes, we can well, see the very top of your browser too, but we're and your your upcoming slides. You can see those. So yeah. let me go to full screen. All right. Well, um, put that down. So. Well, all I can say is I stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, the people uh, who have preceded me, Dr. Shulsky, Dr. Bell, Dr. Poole, have all uh, touched on topics that I'm going to discuss. And um, I'm coming at this, though, not from the point of view of somebody who has been immersed in climate change my whole life, but somebody who has come to it very recently uh, as a citizen. and. Yes, I'm a physician and I have a great interest in this topic now um, that I realize how critical it is uh, to all of us. And so I wanna start with what we know about climate change. And again, uh, this kind of echoes exactly what Dr. Shulsky told us. And I think that's because uh, the data is so compelling. And even for those who have not been paying attention for the last 30 years, we know that climate change is real. It's us, we cause it um, by our uh, burning of fossil fuels. It's bad, I can't even begin to um, discuss that, but I appreciate Dr. Bell's discussion of it. And it's unhealthy uh, as, as we've heard from Dr. Poole particularly, but I also wanna emphasize what Dr. Bell said, and that is that it's unevenly unhealthy in that people who are living in resource poor countries, people who are living in poverty, those who are living in low lying areas, people of color are known to be particularly vulnerable to climate change. And you know we could anticipate waves of food insecurity, poor health, homelessness, and death that may be disproportionately uh, found in those populations as opposed to those with power and money. So climate, climate change is an, uh, climate action really is a matter of social justice and one of equity as much as it is of human health. And all of these uh, facts can be extensively found uh, supported by data in uh, what's been refer referred to previously, the United Nations 
um, intergovernmental uh, a report on climate change, the IPCC report. There have been three of these sixth assessment reports in the last year, the last of which came out Monday. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So before you decide you wanna throw up your hands in despair and crawl into a cave, I wanna tell you that there is hope and that solutions exist right now. Um, you've heard these terms, adaptation and mitigation, um, these are the two ways that we can approach climate change. They really are what's available to us right now. Uh, adaptation is adapting to life in a changing climate. And you can see this litany of um, sort of Armageddon-like problems that we uh, discussed, extreme heat, drought, air pollution, wildfires, storms, infections, my own uh, area, food insecurity, economic and mental health instabilities, and, you know, when you look at this, you think to yourself, how can we possibly adapt to this? Well, the truth is we have to. The truth is also that some of us will not. The World Health Organization estimates that 250,000 people yearly will die as a consequence of climate change in the next couple of decades. And so we have to make these adjustments. Um, the second piece of the equation, the piece of the solution really, is mitigation. And that means reducing climate change by reducing the flow of heat trapping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, that is a simplistic statement. And it is, as Dr. Shulsky mentioned, incredibly complicated, incredibly difficult. It will not be cheap or easy, but it's urgent. It has to happen as soon as possible, probably years ago. So we're gonna talk a little bit about these uh, two ways to uh, approach climate change, um, and especially from a public health standpoint. So the public health adaptations to climate change, fortunately, are those that have been in place for years, really a uh, hundred years, um, with responses to lots of other things, especially infectious diseases. But climate change is interesting because it is a global problem but the effects will be felt locally. And so local public health action is what's required. And in each of these bright yellow callouts, you can see the activities that will be required, um, are required of public health entities at the state and local levels primarily, um, but guided by federal um, agencies like NOAA, like EPA, like CDC, there are just a plethora of them. But these activities include forecasting, modeling, uh, and vulnerability assessments of our local community and at the state level, surveillance, outbreak investigations, and then doing the research to support um, preparedness planning and then ultimately training of the, the public health and emergency response uh, and really the medical community as well. So I wanna go through a few of these uh, problems and even disasters that are occurring. You've heard that they're occurring with greater frequency, with greater intensity, and they are causing tremendous health problems, uh, the likes of which we have not previously seen. Extreme heat, um, as you heard from Dr. Bell, kills so many more people than we could imagine. Uh, it's a real killer in the United States uh, last year, last summer. In July, there was uh, a heat wave that occurred in the Pacific Northwest um, that killed uh, hundreds of people, but there have been tens of thousands of people in prior heat waves in the last couple of decades in Europe and in health professionals in concert with people like Dr. Shulsky, uh, meteorologists and climate scientists must use heat prediction models to prepare for what's going to happen. You can see that the Midwest and the US uh, Southeast and Southern states in the map in the upper right um, depicts increases in the number of heat wave days in uh, a 38 year period up to 2016. And we are really in the midst of that grouping. So heat response plans are what uh, public health departments do to protect vulnerable people. And these are not just people at the extremes of age, elderly and children, but now include, and you can see in these pictures, people who are 
working outdoors or who are athletes playing outdoors. These are people who need to um, be aware and recognize of the uh, symptoms of heat stress and be able to um, mitigate those. The other public health uh, tasks include surveillance and risk awareness, uh, especially for uh, heat stroke, uh, heart disease, respiratory disease, kidney disorders. These are the people who are going to be most susceptible to the uh, ill effects of extreme heat. With regard to air pollution, um, the main functions of public health are to monitor air quality, specifically things like ozone and particulate matter that are the most important contributor contributors to uh, lung problems. And then to use that air quality information to uh, alert the public using air quality alert systems. Um, you may recall that uh, again, July of last year, the wildfires occurring in uh, the, the Pacific Northwest in Canada were huge and that smoke swept across the country as it uh, can easily do um, and, and came to affect not only areas of uh, lower Minnesota, but also coming into Iowa and Omaha. And there was an alert posted on July 29th about um, poor air quality and what people needed to do to avoid going outdoors, especially in patients with COPD, risk to, uh, heart disease and asthma. So those wildfire alerts are, are part of, of the system that can protect us. I also want to note that uh, the picture in the upper right uh, shows that the sort of ominous look of that wildfire smoke, but it also contributes to some of the beautiful sunsets that we had uh, last summer. I'm not saying that's a good thing, but something to be aware of. So storms and flooding, again, we heard that these are increasing with uh, greater frequency, intensity, and as we speak, the uh, entire southeastern United States is under a watch for uh, severe storms, for flooding, tornadoes, et cetera. These things are going to continue to happen, and the role of public health is really in disaster preparedness. So um, you're familiar with all of these emergency um, preparations, and really, that's all that we can do at this point with regard to adaptation. Infectious diseases, um, somebody asked about this in the chat, and this is, of course, my area of expertise. You know, public health uh, departments have for 100 years or more been um, engaged in the activities of surveillance for infection outbreaks, especially water and food contamination, and uh, alert systems have been in place for many, many years. In Nebraska, it's the health and human services alerts that go out to physicians primarily, and then there's the public education piece uh, about food, water, and vector-borne infections. But I want to focus here on the ticks. Um, black plague and ticks, deer ticks, are the vectors of Lyme disease bacteria. And of course, when we first started hearing about this, oh, you know, 30, 40 years ago, it was from Lyme, Connecticut. It was the northeastern part of the United States where Lyme was really a problem. It kind of expanded a bit into the uh, upper northwest. But really, for years, we never had Lyme in Nebraska. This was simply not a disease that you could catch here because the ticks did not exist here. Um, but these black-legged ticks thrive in warmer temperatures and higher humidity. And with climate change, those um, conditions have become more frequent in Nebraska and expanded the tick habitat. And now for the first time, uh, we've had black-legged ticks established in uh, Nebraska in 2019. And we will be seeing, I think we have seen a couple of cases of endemic Lyme disease here. So you can catch that disease. So mitigation, let's turn to that. And there is a single word. This is the solution, decarbonization. I, I can't say this any more simply, although it's, a, again, a vastly difficult problem uh, to, to, to actually undertake uh, decarbonization. But let me just show you um, in this graph that you've seen before, um, at least a part of this, or a, a, a sort of a rendition of this graph. This is one from the most recent uh, assessment of the IPCC. 
And what it shows is carbon dioxide emissions on the y-axis and five scenarios. These are models. These are projections of what the uh, temperature rise will be, or rather the carbon dioxide output and then the associated temperature rises will be with various levels of mitigation, of decarbonization. The blue scenarios are dependent on immediate and rapid decarbonization, and that's at the bottom where you can see that temperature rises um, of 1.4 and 1.8 degrees centigrade may occur by 2100, whereas that sort of yellowish line is um, what may happen if substantial steps occur are occurring quickly to reduce emissions, and we may get to 2.7 degrees centigrade, um, whereas the redder lines show exceedingly high temperature elevations by the end of the century. Um, and these are a more realistic reflection of, of what we have been doing. So we need to act very quickly. We need to start decarbonization immediately and aggressively. But the, the good news is we've actually started. In many countries um, across the globe, including in some localities and some states in the United States, this process has has started in, in great uh, measure uh, with policies, with um, uh, laws, with businesses actually self-imposing decarbonization. I think all of the big, um, the big tech company, uh, internet companies, um, Google, Amazon, or well, not Amazon, but you know, all of them have reached a net zero uh, level of carbon use or generation. And in our own locality, I want to uh, highlight what OPPD has done. Um, you know, Nebraska has the distinction of being the only state in the union that has fully public uh, power companies. Uh, and I think that's something to be very proud of. These companies that are OPPD, uh, Lincoln Electric, and uh, NPPD have supplied uh, inexpensive and reliable power to Nebraskans for decades. And they, OPPD and all of the others actually are engaged in these long-term um, commitments, plans to uh, shift their energy sources for our electrical power from coal and gas to wind and solar by 2050. Um, there may be different um, trajectories here. We may be able to do it more quickly, but um, I think that you should know that OPPD and others are actively working on this and this will occur. We will make transitions um, in the next couple of decades to wind and solar as our primary sources of uh, energy to generate electrical power. So I want to end by talking about the most recent um, sort of chapter of this IPCC report um, that is climate change mitigation, uh, and that came out two days ago. And I'm going to summarize very way too briefly for a several thousand page report um, what it says, and it basically notes that we have options in all sectors, all sectors of the economy to at least have emissions by 2030. And by sectors, we mean energy industry, agriculture, transportation, and building sectors. Low and zero emission energy sources are available right now. They are being employed right now. All you have to do is drive down Route 80 through Iowa to see that. Iowa now has 60% of its power supplied by wind. The cost of many of these low emission sources have fallen dramatically since 20, uh, 2010. In fact, 85% of reduction these are affordable. They are now more affordable than, than digging coal out of the ground and extracting oil. Um, the changes that need to be made though really are dramatic. They're not going to be cheap or easy, but they are urgent and they are available. So why aren't they being done? As Dr. Shulsky mentioned, if it were just all based on the science, they would have been done years ago. But it's political will or lack thereof. That is the greatest barrier 
to making the changes that are necessary to improve human health and human life on earth and, and really the ecology of the globe. So with that, I wanna urge you to get educated and to get active. This is critical. Um, if you hear nothing else from us today, uh, I want you to get engaged. Um, and so there are a lot of climate organizations that one can join. Um, it doesn't require more than you know, 15 or 20 minutes in a week. Uh, you can become educated by lots of credible, credible information about climate uh, on government websites and also our own UNL Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Um, become engaged in at least the discussion that your uh, energy company wants, wants you to engage in. Provide feedback to what's happening at OPPD. And government contacts, essential. Um, I actually have a lot of these on speed dial on my phone, and I think that you might want to do that. Just say that you want your representatives to vote in a climate active way. Uh, so with that, I'll end and tell you to keep calm and stop burning fossil fuels. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Freifeld. Uh, we are, you know, we've approached our one hour time, um, but I do want to give one last opportunity for anyone to perhaps follow up on what you just said and uh, address a question in the chat. And that's just what we can do as a scientific community to better communicate um, these issues with people where they are at in their current state of mind. I think this is a whole nother panel discussion. We will plan this and, and bring it to you. But is there anyone who would like to, to address that concept about communication? I, I think this is Alison Freifeld, and I think that uh, that's a terrific question because I think that it gets to the heart of the matter. Um, the, the science is absolutely clear. We know what's happening and we actually have solutions, as I mentioned. There are ways that um, this can be altered. Um, it's hard uh, to communicate with people who are complete naysayers. Uh, it's hard to deal with those who are completely skeptical, but um, regardless of what people believe, the, the climate has changed. And so I think that you know, the best way is for symposia like this. And um, we see the World Herald, for example, um, constantly putting out articles about how, you know, we're looking at various disasters, big and small in Nebraska. But I think that we have to have a much more um, open conversation somehow with the public, um, with, with people to, allow them to ask those questions and, um, and feel more comfortable with, with the science, um, especially with communicators as those we had today on this panel. So, but I also would say that just take that few minutes to go on a website, any of the ones that I've, I've shown, and I'm happy to personally share those with you or have a conversation with, with anybody about this. Um, but get educated, look at what's happening and look at what the solutions are. But beyond that, it's hard, it's hard to hammer it home further um, to know how to, how to communicate those things. So I'll, I'll ask my other panelists what they think. So I, I'll just add a little bit to that. I certainly agree. Um, with, with what was said here, I, the most important thing in my opinion is knowing your audience. And that's something that I always ask whoever I'm speaking with is uh, how do they feel about this and making sure that you get the correct frame. The information that I present doesn't, or the content doesn't necessarily have to be very different, but the frame that I put around it is typically tailored to whoever I'm speaking with and knowing where, meeting them where they are um, is really important. And we, I was part of a project where we conducted surveys among um, cities in a four state region and, and asked the people that worked with the cities, how do they talk about climate change what's the best way and they said through extreme weather events and the economics um, so extreme weather events is something that we all feel it's a tangible local way that we feel 
um, the impacts, which is really important. And then through our wallets, that's it's the economics of it is another way that we is a tool or good frame to put around the topic of climate change. So I, I, I think that's great. I, I would like to just follow up on that as well. I think that's a great way to, to approach it. And one other way to frame it is what is it in the world that you find precious in nature that you don't want to see change that could be affected by climate change, but always finding that common ground um, of what do you appreciate uh, about the earth, about your health, about um, the world right now, and how is that going to be affected? So uh, I, I think that's a great um, perspective. Uh, thank you all for participating today. We, I know we could probably talk about this for another hour. So I, I promise I will actually work on getting a follow-up panel um, put together to talk more specifically about messaging and communities and, and making change. Uh, thank you again. Follow us on Nebraska Cures social media um, or check us out at nebraskacures.com for additional information. Thank you again to our panelists and to everyone who joined us today. Thanks. <laughs>